Everybody, welcome to another installment of Show Review with Mike G, the show of life, the show of Washington, D.C., Baltimore, skateboarding, and whiskey. Today's guest is the amazing Benny Hurwitz, the new Wild Turkey brand ambassador here in the States. And I have to say it's going to be good to see him next week. He will be here at Seven Grand Austin, February 6th, talking about the amazing drams of Wild Turkey, some Russell's Reserve in there, I hope, some one-on-one bourbon. We talk about plenty of things. We talk about being courteous, paying your dues, skateboarding, cutting your hair, finding love in the bar scene, and so much more, while also sipping some brilliant vintage drams of Russell's Reserve. So without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this great chat with Benny Hurwitz of Wild Turkey. Not at all. (laughs) Uh, No, that's where skateboarding came in, man. Um, I started when I was young probably got my first skateboard when i was like maybe six years old no from way. my grandma i don't think she even knew what she was giving me was it a real one or was it nash it was a nash yeah. <laughs> and i rode it around on my knee yeah uh eventually stood up on it and just like ride it around this neighborhood i lived in like this cool townhouse community yeah. that just was all sorts of streets weaving through it so we me and a few other kids like all got skateboards like pretty young and like I went through a lot of phases growing up where I didn't skate as well. Like really? for years at a time, it's kind of weird. I haven't just like skated my whole life through. Yeah, gone through phases, different styles. What and... I, I would love to hear what was one of your yeah. darker moments. I had baggy Jenkos, so if oh, that tells you yeah. anything. That was well, a that bit. was that was the first. That was like Jenkos were a thing when I was I was probably only like twelve. Yeah. So I really wanted them. My parents were like, what the fuck are those? <laughs> 30 inches wide around the ankle. For what reason would you want them? Yeah. Right? It looks insane. I think they're coming back, though. They are. You know, I I was really happy with the shift in jean tightness. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I'm an equal opportunity. It looks good on guys. It looks good on girls. This Jenko thing is going to totally mis- it's gonna dem- mystify yeah. the human figure again. I fucking hate that. <laughs> what are you? <laughs> What about those colors, man? Cross colors? Remember those? Jenko's but in strange colors. Yeah, I don't think I ever had those. I just had the jean, classic the black, jean okay. color. Is it go along with the hip-hop lifestyle? And I'm not trying to make an assumption we're just talking about music. No, but there's... yeah, um, I was always kind of more into hip-hop growing up. Yeah. Um, so I think like that is where I kind of like changed styles a little more and got away from skating for a little bit and started yeah. hanging out with kids and like skipping school and stuff but like <laughs> got back into it it's skateboarding has like taken me a lot of places and done a lot of things a lot of friends i have friends that like i went to high school with that are pro skaters oh, still shit. now we're like in our 30s so and it gets guess that's cool how's the body holding up when you skate now it's all right i definitely don't do it as much now i'm traveling a lot yeah and, but now that i moved to la it's like i've got the itch to like go out because it's it's just perfect it's where it started right like bones brigade and stuff in california anyway i mean it makes a lot a lot of sense so you know you're doing this rural thing what are what are your folks doing what what kind of industries were they so my dad's uh worked for general motors oh really 40 years yeah so he's uh worked like in dealerships and different parts of like corporate there but uh yeah man he's been doing that a long time he's 71 He's still doing it. Yeah, and he's gonna probably retire in like he says, like two or three years. I love that my dad. He's like the Jimmy Russell of uh, (laughs) GMC. The work is not done. Yeah, never done. You still have to keep pushing and selling. But you know what? Like, do you think about retirement? I know I'm jumping around, but like, you're young, or I'm young, but I don't think I can ever just stop. Yeah, I I do uh, actually. My I was like. Even though my dad hasn't retired, yeah. he kind of like raised me like in this like save money, yeah, retirement mindset. I see. He's just like trying to cap it off so he can retire comfortably, right, or whatever. So, yeah, man, I think about that. I think I'm on a decent path to retire one day. It's interesting the the skills to save money of which I don't really have. I've got some assets or whatever, but like, 
in the bartending community especially, it doesn't feel like it is a skill set that people feel comfortable with learning about. Mm-hmm. And it's something that I'm starting to see more and more people get really keen on. It's like, because you were tipping out, maybe you're not paying taxes on it and stuff. But did you find like you had a nice balance between maybe frugality and then kind of living that skater lifestyle when you're behind the bar? Yeah, well, it kind of started before I worked in bars. Yeah, because there's a gap, man. All right, so this is the thing. And I, we'll hop back to this. So, like, you have this, you, so you graduate in 2003, mm-hmm. high school. And then there's this, like, dark ages yeah. in, your, in your history, right? And, I mean, there's still the k- skater stuff, and you started working at, at uh, Jack Rose. That's because it's kind of like pre-social media right. for me. It's To me, that's like the, well. the demilitarized zone. It's just fucking <laughs> no light comes out of there, you know, because I'm trying to do this research. And, yeah. Well, we're... Did you think that you wanted to do college? Did you think that you wanted to move? There was a little bit of that. Like I said, I was never very studious. So high school just did enough to graduate on time. Yeah, My parents were very pleased. They never (laughs) pushed me to apply to colleges or anything. I didn't even take the SATs. I Man, I tried not to. I took the ACT instead, actually. So I ended up just going into community college and taking like a placement test. Yeah which didn't get me very far. So it was like, all right, I guess I'll just like do this for a while. Um, skating was my thing. So I like skated and then I was working part-time at a dry cleaner. No kidding. Yeah. So that's, these are the dark ages. So, but that sounds pretty nice. Yeah, it was cool. So it was like, I started there in high school, worked there into community college, which was literally just like, you know, appeasing my parents sort of, they didn't care that much. Right. They more so cared like, Oh, you're working, saving money, just like work hard. This dry cleaner ended up being a really good opportunity. Uh, It was owned by this family, the Slans, and they had Slan Slan companies. But what is a Slan? That's I don't. That's their last name. Where's it from? They're Jewish. Jewish. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. David Slan, and I worked at this dry cleaner all in all eight years. I ended up becoming a district manager and running like multiple stores. So I learned about like running small businesses no through dry cleaning yeah. of all things, which didn't fit me at all really. So it was like <laughs> I was living this dual life of like working in Germantown, Maryland, yeah. driving between these dry cleaner stores, you know, day to day, helping run day to day and all the stuff. And then as soon as like it was time to clock out, I'd like drive down to DC, go skating, yeah. and like hang out at night with friends, and like that's how I kind of started becoming friends with people in bars. Yeah, and um, I had a buddy, or I have a buddy, Steve Teague. He's an OG DC skateboarder. Yeah, but he owns a bar called Bread Soda on Wisconsin Avenue, Glover Park. Amazing, and it's known as like the skater bar. But it's kind of off the beaten path. It's kind of in like an upscale, it's like upper Georgetown, yeah. but also kind of a college neighborhood. So it's a neighborhood bar, pool tables and stuff. But all the guys that run it are like old skaters from the 90s in yeah. D.C., which is like kind of a, a scene that kind of died off, but yeah. came back nowadays. So he basically just let me bar back one night. I was like, I just want to get into this. I really want to get out of this like dry cleaning thing. I'm living like this double life and driving <laughs> 45 what? minutes. <laughs> was it the, I'm just trying to like, what, it's because, what's the like, double life about it though? Because in the dry cleaner, I'm like wearing a suit and I have all these tattoos it, yeah. and I'm like talking to customers and managing these high school kids and these <laughs> other employees. Right. So all the dry cleaners we ran were working plants so we did all the cleaning there wow. so i had to learn how to run all the equipment do everything Man. so it was nice duality yeah you know because in a way that made you perfectly balanced yeah superman was like a journalist yeah you know? there you go <laughs> so steve let me uh bar back and pick up shifts and it was like very consistent where somebody would want to get a shift covered now that this new guy was around because <laughs> all the guys bar back in there were like Barbacking there and maybe like bartending or barbacking somewhere else. Right. So they would, and like the money was, is good in DC in the industry. Yeah. And, you know, eight, 10 years ago, or whenever this was, it was like I could bar back three nights a week and make a, make a living. And wow. it did take a big change in lifestyle. So going from like running a small business for someone else. Yeah. But, making good money i had a 401k benefits some stability all this right? stuff lots yeah. of stability apartment 
by myself, yeah. car, sold the car, moved into a group house, like lived down closer into the city yeah, yeah. in Columbia Heights. And I had the smallest room in the house. It was 400 bucks a month. And I like downgraded all these things. Yeah. But like my quality of life was so much better. I was like riding my bicycle to work, skateboarding everywhere. I had a lot of time off in the beginning because I only needed so much money. Right. And I was like 25. And it was me like taking a step away from having a lot of responsibility. Right. But at the same time, I was like learning this whole new industry. I didn't even realize it yet. I didn't know what I wanted to do because yeah. it was like I wanted to do this because I knew I could make money in bars, but I knew that I, I thought I wanted to do something else. Yeah. Is it, was it basically, so not knowing exactly, you know, which industry you're going to go into, but it felt like a better match. For it you. felt like a, a match for my personality and what I wanted to do in my free time and where I wanted to be and yeah. where I wanted to live and the people I wanted to be around. Yeah. And I just got really into it. And like, it's funny Back then, you know, I was drinking like Bud Lights and <laughs> flavored at the vodka Alley Bar. And at at Alley Bar. See, now this we we refrain from talking about this, but this is mm-hmm. the perfect segue for this. Drinking's a great thing, and you can do it just about anywhere. And now I have a notion of what I would call it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so tell me what Alley Bar is. So right around this time, starting in bars, like skateboarding was life, and just hanging out with buds, you know, Mm -hmm. we would, me and a lot of my really close friends, we all have a lot of tattoos and we've got bro tats where we get them together (laughs) and we would hang out at the shop. We're all friends with the guys there and we all grew up skateboarding. So like we would just hang out and then, you know, sometimes we'd be like going to get a tattoo. We'd skate there and we would drink a couple beers before because You know, you you want to get a little like buzz, let relax sure, a little sure, before yeah. you get stabbed with a needle a thousand times. Of course. So even though they tell you not to drink before, because it thins your blood or whatever, right? Thins your blood or whatever. They're not but, doctors, will they know? Yeah, fine. <laughs> but still, you can't drink in the tattoo shop. Right. Even though we knew the guys, we really couldn't just like bring paper bags in there. Right. So we drank in the alley behind the tattoo shop. Yeah. Which we deemed Alley Bar. <laughs> so Alley Bar then just kind of grew into like the name of the crew for yeah. a little bit. Oh nice. And it absorbed a whole bunch of other guys that we skated with and we ended up turning it into like a series of skate videos. Yeah. And there's actually ten Alley Bar videos. You I've can seen find. a couple. Yeah. So they're all on YouTube. Yeah. And yeah, it's like Alley Bar one, two, three, four. I think I want to say like my favorites are probably like four or five around there. Maybe four to seven. Okay. Because we were like so serious about it because it was like the first three. It's like, oh, look at these dumb videos and like cell phone footy yeah. and like whatever. And then it evolved by by four, five, six, seven. It was like we were taking it serious, like making like elaborate edited intros oh, for them. Man. Like there's a Halloween one. Really? That one. I need to watch. Is that so I want to say it's five. Five is the right Halloween in the middle. One. Then we've got okay. Yeah. So that's probably my favorite. That one's legendary. And I had like crazy long hair back then. Really? Down past my shoulders. That's it. When did you cut it? Or rather, why did you cut it? I probably it? cut it five years ago now. Yeah. Um, I was over it, man. It was like, it's hard. It's work yeah. to have long hair. It's all Commend hot everyone stuff. with long hair, man or woman. Yeah, dude. The beard is a good touch too. I actually find that beards make make it cooler. They're sweat yeah. wicking. A lot of people don't think that. But I, did you have a beard then too? Yeah, I've always like had some scruff so yeah. i'd like maybe shave and let it comes back real quick yeah I know the feeling. but i've had this beard with some length on it now for probably five years really yeah man i don't, I don't no, know maybe three because i cut it once like when i first started dating my wife like three years ago mm-hmm. um i shaved it once to show her what i look like and she's and like, she was don't like, you do that don't ever do it again, again. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm t- I feel like in a way I'm on an embargo against everybody, be- or they've got an embargo against me having a, a clean shaven face. It stranges everybody out. Do you re- so now I feel obligated to always have a fucking facial hair. Mm-hmm. Well, now I think no one will recognize me, and that's the like. I wonder if that's good or not. I don't know. I don't know if that's good. I think I need to, like I'm going to all these places now for my job, and I meet all these people. Yeah. It's like if I meet you with this long beard and then I shave it, it's like you're it's not part gonna- of the brand, isn't it? Part of your brand, rather. It, it has become... Because Mike's got... He's got a beard, too. Yeah. Isn't he? Yeah. And he's had a longer beard than that, too. Really? Yeah. Hmm. But he just... 
you know, you can shave it a little bit. Like, I'm sure I could trim, yeah, trim it okay. down, but it's okay. I wish we had smell vision for a couple of reasons. I won't get into it, but... <laughs> <laughs> so this then takes, it seems like a nice spiritual match. You know, you head to D.C., you're staying with some mates, you're getting to skateboard, you're actually probably healthier because you're skating and then you're biking, you know? But at what point did the the bartending piece or the cocktail piece when did that come center stage and really become like a, a formidable way to yeah. make a living so i mean started at bread soda it was probably 25 yeah 24 maybe and like i came from like running a business so they could see my drive right and i'm like literally my job is to get ice cut fruit and wash dishes so there's mm-hmm. like this guy's really good at this <laughs> and i'm like it's, I have to do four, three or four things. Like this is <laughs> yeah. awesome, and then we get to do shots at the end of the night. Like this is like I'm in my hundred less rules. things than yeah. So, um, the owner. Fast forward a little bit. The owner of Jack Rose, who's the owner of another bar, Bourbon, before that, oh, okay. and then he was a part owner of Bread Soda. Oh, so no they're kind of tracing it back. Um, so Bill Thomas, he's the connection between these bars and the manager of the bourbon in Adams Morgan. Mm. I became friends with him from working at bread soda. And then he was like, Oh, well you need more shifts. You don't have consistent shifts. That's cool. I need somebody. So then I ended up working at bourbon yeah. and bread soda was like, that's cool. Like they were literally helping me out. They would be like, you can come in and train with this guy. We don't need anybody right now. Yeah. And then they're like, but if people call off, like you can be, you're the substitute bar back. That's right. right. You don't have a full position. So that's all I had. And I was living off of that because everybody was calling out all the time. <laughs> but then got pulled over to Bourbon, and that's when it became like full schedule. So I was like probably, and by that I mean three nights right, of right. bar backing, which was awesome because it was like Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Mm. And uh, just did my best there, and that was a lot more physical. It was high volume. It's in a neighborhood that's known for like college party bars for yeah. a long, long time, like 20 plus years. And it's kind of evolving now with places like Jack Rose and there's a restaurant that opened several years ago, Mintwood Place. Okay. And uh, that's where Tail Up Goat is. They got a Michelin star. Nice. And the Line Hotel just opened in Adams Morgan. They've got two dope restaurants in there. So the neighborhood's changing now. But yeah. like eight, ten years ago, it was still that kind of college scene. So bourbon was high volume, like. Literally, I would walk through a crowd with like a bus tub over my head, grabbing shit with like mm. a flashlight in my mouth, like shining it in people's faces if they didn't get out of my way. Mm. And that was like totally cool. You know what I mean? And you make it work. Just three sinks going wild. Yeah. And yeah, you missed all those that days? stuff. Like I created moves at that bar to like, like there was this one. So the bar was like a weird setup. So it's just kind of like longer than it was wide. Um, and then two bars kind of like catty cornered from each other. Mm-hmm. And then the smaller bar had a loft above it with a little staircase. Mm. And I used to like, I don't know if I'm painting a good picture right now, but I basically would like, instead of trying to walk down through the crowd after coming down from the loft, right, right. I would go like under the railing and like jump behind the small bar yeah, to just get to that bar, to get to that bartender to like see what they needed. Man. And I was just like the Spider-Man of this <laughs> bar. And I like created a move that were, I would like climb through this thing that looks so sketchy. <laughs> but you made it? Yeah. No, it's fine. I think they still do it on high volume now. Like they're it's like part of the so training. Like, yeah, they're yeah. like, all right, and you can climb through this thing <laughs> if you need to get them anything. Well, it's you're nuts. If if we ever end up in prison together, you're the guy that's going to find our path out. Yep. I, I think I don't that. like small tunnels, though. That terrifies me. Well, what if it's a big tunnel? Small to big tunnel. Like you got Ugh. Shawshank, man. It's very small. <laughs> I'm like freaking out now. <laughs> I'm yeah, like, this microphone's too close. <laughs> we are strapped in. It's quite a symbolic thing. Those are the you know these are the days where you weren't center stage. You were like a guitar tech. You yeah, know dude. what I mean? Did you miss that? I love those days. Yeah, those are the days. I think everybody should go through that before mm-hmm. they're a bartender. Like just hustle. Mm-hmm. Because if you know everything the bartender needs, then you'll know what you need. From your bar back right. when you're ready. I mean, yeah. and then you can communicate that forward. Mm-hmm. Do you think that people? And I hate to no people. There's a lot of star tender drama. There's lots of ego. 
and the technology that's around us kind of allows for it a little bit. But do you think people are paying their dues the same way anymore? I think a lot of people are, will agree that not everybody is paying the same dues that people used to have to. Yeah. To like become a bartender. And that, I mean, you still got to serve some time and to get that shine. Sure. You know what I mean? But I think what bothers me more is that people that are too gun ho about it. Hmm. Like just gung ho about not just, about taking shortcuts, like or just wanting to be that. Got it, got it. Got it's it, like yeah. you should want to learn everything. First. Crawl before you can walk, kind of thing. Right? Yeah. What do you think is a vital skill that you learn besides fitting through small places that people maybe overlook? I don't know if it's a skill, but I think uh, humility mm. is the biggest thing. Yeah. Do you have not having having that ego? The, you're, so you you seem to me like a really big team player, yeah. part of a group. You know, like you're there for to make sure other people have that success, Absolutely. and that's that is part of you. Do you like then the, the opposite, which is you're kind of like center stage now. You're an ambassador for Wild Turkey. I mean, yeah, but I'm still part of a team yeah. that supports me a lot. Because I'm very new to this. Yeah. Like, I was bartending two months ago. Yeah. So. It's cool, man. It's kind of like, I, I'm glad that we're here. Well, I'm glad to be sipping bourbon with you, but I'm glad that it's in this moment. This is the first time in Austin. This is your first time being, I think, the full-time brand ambassador, mm-hmm. right? But you, you know, you've cut your teeth on some places that are legendary, you know? The Columbia Room, mm-hmm. which I've heard about for years. A brilliant spot from every like it's just one of these things that people like compel them. they're like you got to go to this place you yeah. have to go to this place what you must have had the skills to end up at jack rose and to end up at the columbia room yeah man to me it was it's always being humble working hard like kind of keeping your head down that mentality yeah i've never been the one to seek out something mm. too hard oh okay and Obviously, this doesn't work out all the time or not for everyone, but like just wait till things kind of come to you. Yeah. I've just kind of been fortunate in that way as well. But I think it comes from my work ethic and just letting that do the talking rather than trying to be the guy who knows the most about everything or at least be the most outspoken about it. Like, I don't need that. So, yeah, I mean, that kind of comes back to where I was like at Bourbon. So, bar backing and just doing that and just happy doing that doing the best i could at it and uh they brought in this woman rachel sergi who's very well known in dc and everywhere i mean she's she lived in san francisco for seven years but she came back to dc and she's one of the founding members of the dc craft bartenders guild oh cool so dc started its own craft bartender guild before the usbg was around or at least they weren't in dc yet Mm -hmm. and it's something that still operates separately from the USBG there, which is yeah. a little weird, but like they, they make it work. I, I think it's good. I think it is good. I think diversity is good. And to be honest, they do a lot for the community. Yeah. So it's amazing. I mean, I would love to see them work cohesively a little more, but like Man. it is what it is and it works right. for DC. Good. So, and I, it's, you know, that's always the case study. We've talked about it in Austin. Nah, you know, I'm publicizing this, but we just talk, right? Mm-hmm. But that is always the place. It's like, well, they did it there, and it actually worked. Because in this case, it predicated the USBG in DC. But I think that those kinds of bodies, you know, I think that they have to have that diversity. And there's people looking for different things mm-hmm. in this kind of community, yeah. you know. So Rachel, she's super OG. She founded that with a couple <laughs> yeah. other guys. She's opened a lot of cool places in DC, mm. and one of them was Jack Rose. So she oh. came into Bourbon um, while I was there. And she kind of took me under her wing. She just liked how I worked. And then I went from working the high volume bar on the weekends to like working the downstairs bar, which was more of the restaurant, which had the whole bourbon collection oh, okay. in this place called bourbon. Sure. So <laughs> I started serving to just get to like, they wanted me to like start talking to people and doing shit. You know, how do you feel about that? It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Like serving was pro- the first time I ever served. I wanted to quit Yeah. because it was like, just like in the weeds and it was it was tough it's like two servers like probably like 15 20 tables inside and then a whole patio with like maybe the same amount and you're both just like running around in and out of both yeah so maybe not the most organized system at first but 
we have helped evolve it. So that was cool too. But she took me under her wing and she just really started to like teach me the classic cocktails and like the history about them. And did, I just did you find that it, yeah. pretty interesting. Yeah. How do you feel about history just in general? Is it something that interests you? Uh, yeah, I feel like even though I wasn't big into school or anything, history was something that I always kind of was interested in. Yeah. Like the stories, you know? Absolutely. The stories about our country and other countries. And that's the other great thing I love about what we do with spirits. I mean, when the more you learn about booze, the more you learn about history, religion, politics. It's right. all tied. It's, I love it. Booze has touched everything. Perfect conduit to culture. Yeah. You know? Because you can read a book for sure. Do it. But booze has seen tough tough days in every one of those places so making cocktails and kind of being connected to that history i imagine that was something that felt like maybe you're part of something bigger now yeah so she basically said you're coming to jack rose and um it probably opened like six months later yeah and i worked one bartending shift at bourbon on the upstairs in the high volume that i'd been bar backing for maybe eight months yeah so i worked one bartending shift so i bar backed probably between bread soda and there about a year before i became a bartender mm. which is like that's a good i answer. think that's fairly quick as well oh, sure sure you know um but yeah i would recommend bar backing to anybody just like kind of getting in especially you know if they're younger and they're yeah. not, they, they've got time on their side do it the right way right yeah so then jack rose opened man and that was crazy like it's it's an eight thousand square foot building, three floors. When we opened, we had a thousand whiskeys. Yeah, how many? Um, but go ahead. No, I'm just like waiting to hear it now. How much? So, when we opened, there was a thousand. But also, when we opened, we only opened the third floor first, which okay. was a roof terrace. So, open air, another like high volume bar concept. The mm. whole idea of Jack Rose was like, we know the neighborhood that we're in. It's like a party neighborhood. Yeah. So we have this crazy roof bar. We're like music driven. At first it didn't have TVs, but we eventually added TVs up there. Mm. Lots of beer and just like frozen machines, stuff like that. So we knew that was like the safety net Uh because in 2011, (laughs) like this big whiskey boom that we're in right now didn't really start till like 2012. Right. Was like when it was after people were realizing. Yeah. So we opened with a thousand whiskeys and no one gave a shit. What? So it was like we had this upstairs that was this insane, awesome party place yeah. like, on the weekends. And then the downstairs was like crickets. And it just went through like a few years of figuring stuff out as far as like what people wanted and what we wanted it to be yeah. exactly. Because it started with like certain rules of downstairs being a little more formal, mm-hmm. which eventually evolved, like ended up all going no dress code or anything but in the beginning there was like stuff like that really so it's did you feel like it was your kind of place when it started out not the the rooftop because you're kind of used to high volume and kind of like Mm -hmm. people having a good time but now you're talking about this more kind of restrained maybe in a good way but this kind of different experience it's a little more sophisticated if you want did that did that match you uh it didn't at first and i um didn't work down there actually for the first couple years jack rose oh really yeah okay so they had a whole nother team and that first level that houses all the whiskey Mm. actually opened like three months after so we opened it like in waves because it was june and we wanted to get the roof open and we were ready and they were still kind of curating the selection they're like that's cool we you know the front door you go in the front door and there's another door to the saloon and there's stairs to go straight up to the roof. So right. it was like, they're kind of two separate entities sure. in a way anyway. So it was easy enough. like, let's right? just open the roof for three months, take advantage of that mm. before the downstairs is really ready and the staff is ready. Yeah. Start making some money. Like these dudes, it's like two guys own this place with some invest, a bunch of investors and they needed to get it open. You yeah. know? No, I totally get us when people make vodka or yeah. gin when they're trying to make whiskey, man. Yeah. You know, exactly. that's how it works. So yeah, it took me a few years and it, Don't get me wrong, like it wasn't just like vodka, soda, and beer up there, but you learn a lot from that regardless. You Mm. know, you learn a lot. It's it's all about like the human interactions and reading the people working under stress, you know, and being able to like manage that and let people know that you're coming and you're gonna take care of them and that you're doing something and also communicating with the team that you're working with, you know? And that's a really cool skill set that I think some people 
miss out as well going straight into yeah. like the small cocktail scene. Did you, I mean, this sounds, it's nice because I'm kind of like, all right, if life's a curriculum, right? Because you go to school, it's a clear degree plan. English 101, philosophy 101, blah, blah, blah. But now it's like you'd go and work in operations. You go shift to being a bar back. You learn kind of starting down here, learning the tasks. Then you're introduced to more people direct on. So it feels like each of these things has given you this other expanded skill set, you know. Mm -hmm. And you're you're a people person ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. I think. I mean, everyone in this industry is a people person. That kind of goes without saying. Sure. But like, yeah, I mean, you just have to kind of like grow your skills. It's you going through the steps. You got to earn your spot. So. They had asked me to work downstairs and still at the time and the way things were trending in DC, like we were doing really well on that roof and we were making a lot of classic cocktails and we had our own signature cocktails up there as well. So we were like, I was learning all of those skills Mm -hmm. and they were leaning on us to start help creating cocktails and things like that. Um, And I was just like, didn't want to go down and take on all that whiskey right away. I was just kind of like, it's overwhelming. still wasn't ready for it. Yeah. And then I also had a bunch of people like in my ear kind of being like, you're going to go down there and make way less money. Oh, I see. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> and I don't still only been in the industry, like maybe three years at this point. Right. So I'm like, I'll listen to what these folks are saying. They haven't like steered me wrong yet. Right. The right. people that I'm working with up here. Eventually, Fast forward a little bit. Um, Rachel left. A uh, new guy started there that a lot of people know, Trevor Fry, one of my good buddies and my I basically Trevor, like my yeah. second mentor after no Rachel. And he, I worked with him the whole time he was at Jack Rose. And he was the one that got me to put myself out there and like go to different trade seminars and Tales of the Cocktail, yeah. Portland Cocktail Week, stuff like that. So... The first thing, and not only did he do that, he kind of helped restructure Jack Rose in a way where um, he became the beverage director. Mm-hmm. I was by no means like next in line by at that point. Right. So he came in as a bartender with more experience and like kind of knowing what's going on in the industry and really like trying to teach that to everybody on the staff. Yeah. And he became the beverage director, but then he appointed me and another girl as head bartenders. Mm. So I was the head bartender on the roof and she was the one in the saloon. Her name's Arlie. She's no longer there. But um, so we were kind of like his next in line to make sure stuff got done and everything was taken care of. And he kind of became like the traveling face for Jack Rose. It was like he kind of showed them the importance of like us being out there and like, yeah, we have all this cool whiskey. We need to like let people know that we're doing this, you know? And he helped and he was a big part of like spreading the word. And he even got it to where like Jack Rose would pay for us to go to stuff. So he would like go on one trip a year with me and one trip a year with Arlie. Mm. So he and I went to Portland cocktail week. What year is this? Like 2014. I was there, mate. Yeah. Well, I, I love it because we've never met. Mm hmm. We've probably been in the same room at least twice before, you know? I, yeah. lo- I just love that about this industry. Yeah. But how was it? How was the experience? Yeah, like your so first that, kind of learning. that just like opened up my eyes. Yeah. And we just went and like audited classes. I didn't yeah. apply yeah. for the Bar Institute or anything. It's just there to see all this. And it was like, this is amazing. Yeah. Like I've just, all these things were new to me already, all the cocktail stuff. And it was just like, everybody's doing this everywhere. This is so cool. And um. It makes From it there, bigger, kind of, right? Like, because you're working in, like, in a bubble in a way. Mm-hmm. But then realizing this is a fucking movement. Yeah. You know? You're part of this larger thing. That's bound to... Because it seems like community and having, the, like, a crew is really, really a good thing for you. Yeah. This is bound to just totally evolve that. It's like, this is a whole nother yeah. subculture. Yeah, totally. So, Portland Cocktail Week definitely did it for me and opened my eyes. And then the next thing after that I did was Behind the Barrel with oh, Wild nice. Turkey. So how was that that first time? So that was amazing. That was the next. So that was the next year. That was 2015. Mm-hmm. So I went to Portland that year as well. Yeah. But behind the barrel was before that in September. And that was the second year of behind the barrel ever. So it was a brand new program. And Dang. it started one year before they brought back three people from the first year as mentors. And then they bring in 
30 new bartenders. And at that point, they would mm. do it once. It was like once a year. Yeah. It was that one session of 30 bartenders. And then I think they did like an international session and brought people from other countries. Yeah. And that was it. So like 30 people got to do this a year awesome. in the States. Man. Is it more? It's more now, isn't it? Now it's, yeah. Quite so now we do more. four sessions. So it's about 120 a year. Man. I mean, you talk about the breadth of reach and wild turkey and all those products man it's grown so much too in the past couple of years we'll talk about that but yeah but these these kind of formative experiences did it make you say okay i'm actually ready to take on more now yeah and portland did that a lot too so when i when i came back from portland the first time was when i decided okay i want to start working in yeah. the other floors of yeah, jack yeah. rose and learn everything that's killer and around that same time is when trevor and another awesome guy named nick lowe mm. who lives in denver now he left Jack Rose uh, to work at Williams and Graham like five years ago or something oh, cool. too. Okay. And he, so he and Trevor started Dram and Grain, which was the third floor that I mentioned in Jack Rose. It's a oh, basement oh, yeah. and it's literally like 500 square feet, like 25 little seats. That's including a six seat bar. Yeah. And the space was always there and it was just underutilized. Right. And these guys came up with an idea to do or like a reservation cocktail yeah. type thing, which was a happy, happening in New York and everything. And right. Well, it's a like of kind of a... places, but like they started doing it one night a week just to try it out. And they proposed this whole idea to the, the owners and mm. were like, this is how we'll do it. We don't want to like pool with the other floors. We don't need to. Right. Like we're going to run it this way and charge this much for drinks. And the service and the experience that we're going to give, it's going to like just bring it all together. Hmm. And they pulled it off. And now um, it's just, it grew and grew. And it's operating in that same space four nights a week. Wow. And now I believe in September, it will finally open. They're opening a new restaurant called Imperial. Uh-huh. And Dram and Grain is moving there oh, wow. into a new space that's like four times the size. Man. So and it's, it's always booked up, I imagine. Yeah, all it's all it's like always booked up. Yeah. Did you ever work down there? Yeah. So down there, I worked with a lot of other cool guys that have come through. Like mm. when that we started to grow that program down there, it actually brought other bartenders in that were like interested that wanted to do these oh cool different cocktails. So um, one of my buddies, Lucas B. Smith, who runs a distillery now called Cotton and Reed, a mm-hmm. rum distillery. They're cool. making like. Rum from sugarcane juice, like yeah. agricole style in nice. DC, and they in have DC. like a yeah. So it's it's pretty That's dope. Crazy, yeah, yeah. They're they're really cool. So he came through there, and he was one of the guys who like taught us all about carbonation and like fermentation, and mm. he was doing all this cool stuff with that. And then one of our other guys, uh, Mikey Barton, who ended up moving to like North Carolina to open a bar, he was in there for a while. Mm. Great guy. And then one of my best friends, Andy Bigsby, who's there. Holding it down nice, now. Nice, Yeah, so. Why'd you leave then? It sounds like it's wrought with opportunity. And it was, and that's what kept me there for seven years. I mean, that's, I, I recently spoke to Dev Johnson from Employees Only. He's been there for a long ass time. And I'm like, how long you been there? He's like over 10, I think it was over, maybe 13 years, something mm-hmm. I can't remember. Like, really? And that kind of dedication demonstrates the kind of people that do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think that's really important. It's almost atypical for the industry stick around that long so i think it's you know commendable yeah you're able to do that yeah i mean and jack rose has a lot to offer because you know i started in a high volume scenario making simple classics and learning how to how to work fast and take care of people then i learned some more technical things and i learned a lot about whiskey (laughs) i can't imagine and uh that's the place i mean being there for seven years, I can easily say I've tasted two thousand whiskeys. But that's like that's the haven, isn't it? Is like as far as I understand it, Jack Rose and that whiskey selection is one of the greatest things in the world. It is. It's it's debatable. I would definitely say it is in one of the best whiskey bars in the world. Yeah, they are. Uh, they claim biggest in the Western Hemisphere. Nice. Is Atlas think, the other one? That's like super big. The one in Singapore. Uh, Atlas. It, it doesn't I matter. So, but I think yeah. that's another one. But, that, in the States, I think the other one is Canon in Seattle. Sure, yeah. And that's like, but they have more than whiskey. Right. So they have, they're claiming like over 3,000. Yeah. But that's 
everything, all different stuff. Jack Rose is really whiskey yeah. focused. And they're claiming 2,700, but like we're talking about like 10,000 ounces of whiskey getting poured a month. Yeah. And like just insane numbers. That's crazy. So, I, I mean, I, you're, it's kind of making my mouth water a little bit. Yeah. Well, good thing we have some more whiskey here. I know. And this is the thing, you know, this is where I think whiskey takes over. And let's try another whiskey and let's talk about your relationship with whiskey, which ultimately leads you to this new role where you're in Austin, Texas, where you're doing staff trainings with wild turkey. So we've got, and I know you <laughs> like it because you're all strapped in, but what we had, there's. Yeah. So we got a choice. Yeah. We got two more. They're both single barrels. Ooh. One is a bourbon, one is a rye. Nice. The bourbon is uh, selected by a bar in Baltimore called Bookmakers. Okay. My buddy Ryan Sparks used to run the bar over there, so he actually picked this barrel. Amazing. Um, One of my favorites. Okay. And that's the bourbon. And then I have this one, which is a barrel that was selected for us, the group that came to Behind the Barrel in 2017, so last year. Um. And it is a single barrel rye. What are you in the mood for? What do you, are you feeling? Because to me, rye is a little more pensive and a little more cerebral. But bourbon is just guttural, sexual, sensual. I know. You know what I mean? I really like this bookmakers one. Let's do it. Do it. Let's, yeah. Yeah. But that's you know that's the, the, the lovely thing about whiskey is that you can say, well, it's all whiskey. Well, that's a terrible thing to say because we're different. We're listening to different bands. We're in different parts of the world. And whiskeys, they, you can use different ones for all kinds of things. And for people that can't see this, this is out of a hot sauce bottle, which is a great way to aerate your whiskey. <laughs> cheers. Well, cheers smells nice. Yeah, so these Russell's barrels, it's like, they're all a little different. Sure. You get to That's what the, I like you about get to, it. You get to taste as many as you want if you go down to the distillery where yeah. we can like send samples to your bar if you oh. don't have time. Wow. Um, so he actually selected this from samples at his bar. Mm. And you're going to taste them at barrel proof, but ultimately it gets bottled at 110. Perfect, though. That's a yeah, great proof for is. turkey, man. It's perfect. And it's unchill filtered. Yeah. And all of – I don't know the exact age. The only person that could really tell you that is – you know eddie or bruce when they're tasting you on the barrel and then you'd have to write it down because we don't actually put the age on the tag i took some pictures but i do know this is from warehouse b Mm. Uh, i want to say from the fifth or sixth floor but i'm going to look right now Mm. so yeah sixth floor uh warehouse b so b is the second oldest warehouse on the property the first being a so A and B are both from the 1890s. That's incredible. And they still haven't cracked open. That's good. No. Well done. And they're also arc- two of the <laughs> smaller Oh, really? Warehouse. Yeah, cuz they're older. They just weren't building them as big. So A was built in 1894 mm. and it's about like 14,000 barrels. Yeah. Compared to like the new ones we're building that I think are like 40 or 50. Holy crap. And then um B is probably a little bit more than that. Slightly bigger was built a few years later. Yeah, as you know, as I'm tasting this, like I'm not going to go through tasting notes. This is something that is deeply passionate, and bosomy and embraces you. What does it smell like in this warehouse? Oh my god, that's what I. That's what I take well, me to the it's, place. It's right? got its own its own smell that is. It smells like bourbon, of course, but it smells like musty oak. Yeah. Like one of the notes that I will commonly use when nosing some of these is like rick house floors that's like a it's its own smell it's like wood seasoned wood yeah and bourbon just all in the air around you so you walk in and it just it smells like you if have you ever left a glass of bourbon maybe like you're drinking at the end of the night and you left like a sip and you woke up the next day it's evaporated and the glass is kind of gross looking yeah and you stick your nose and you smell it, it smells good. Yeah. That's what it smells like. So you walk in a Rick house and it's mm-hmm. evaporated bourbon, you know, it's happening all around you. So you walk in, it's like you're walking into an, a dirty glass that you're, you drank from the night before. You're probably actually walking into bourbon as it is evaporated. Yeah. Like you were ensconced in bourbon, the smell, the age, probably some, is there that 
kind of wetness, like a slight kind of muskiness, I guess. Is that the, I think yeah, on the lower word. floors, yeah. you'll probably get a little more of that. As you go up, it gets hotter, so it's yeah. getting a little more humid as well. Oh, man. So It's like a bourbon sauna. sauna. Yeah, it can be. This is a remarkable pick. It is. Super big. And just really like... <laughs> You ever talk to a group, so like I know that you've got plenty of education you'll be doing, you'll be doing seminars, you'll be doing staff trainings and everything, but you ever had those conversations with a group of people, but there's that one person that has so much magnetism, you cannot take your eyes off of them and stop talking to them. That is what this bourbon is. It demands your fucking attention. Mm -hmm. And that's it. But it doesn't have to ask too hard either. It doesn't even have to wave you over. No. No. It's a pre, like, I'm already here. You got my complete and utter attention. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, man. Wow. And at 110, too, that's a brilliant thing is it never drinks like that because yeah. it's so robust and so flavorful. Now, I know you did a stint at the Columbia Room, and I don't want to marginalize that or discount it. I think that that seems like a next logical step for the, the cocktail piece, but I am curious how you connected with the Wild Turkey folks. Why are you the guy? I'm beginning to see why yeah. you're the guy. But like, so behind the barrel was my first connection. Yeah, and I mean, it, behind the barrel is real. It's everything we say. When you go there, you're hanging out with the Russells for three days. Yeah. Bruce is there every night at the campfire. Bruce and Joanne are there with you. Mm. If you all don't know Joanne Street, she's Jimmy's granddaughter. Mm. So she works at the distillery. She helps with all the events there, and she's also a brand ambassador. So she travels a little bit, and the two of them. I mean, they're just like your buddies. They're just hanging out with you the whole time. Yeah. And then there's all sorts of activities and games. Like we make it fun and interactive. Gets you to run around, sweat a little bit, roll sure. some barrels, stuff like that. Yeah. But then we also do bourbon blending, skeet shooting. And through all this, Eddie and Jimmy are there just hanging out. Damn. You know. Can anybody drink more bourbon than Jimmy? I've heard some stories. A few years ago... Man, <laughs> I don't have any personal stories, so I, I don't want to like repeat any that aren't mine. Let's, but, but I love this because this is like folklore because this is the stuff that's going to live on. These stories about him. Oh, God. You know what I mean? Well, I think it's okay to tell this because these have been told on podcasts before. But I, there's a story about like Jimmy causing Dave Pickroll to miss his flight at Tails <laughs> one year because they were drinking until like six in the morning. Yeah, I think I've heard this story. Yeah. So that one is legendary. Um. <laughs> like literally they're drinking in the bar and Dave's like, all right, I got to get out of here. Actually, I can catch my flight. And he realizes he's like, he, his flight was an hour or something, <laughs> something nuts. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good one. But now it, I mean, Eddie's the one to hang with Eddie yeah. and Bruce, man. You should see Bruce chug a beer, dude. Oh it's man. Like, whew, light speed. Yeah. I, I, I can see it. Yeah. It's so these are cool guys. To yeah, hang out for with. sure. Like this, you know, this is like hanging out with Motley Crue in the eighties. These fucking guys can do it. And yeah. do it right. But all really likable, lovable gents. Yeah. So the conversation, they approached you, or did you say, I am so in love with this juice? Well, it, that it was a long time coming. And it again, I don't pursue these things. That's right. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I was, again, kind of backtracking. Jack Rose, long time. Really got into the whiskey yeah. after that. Spent many years. Eventually took over the bar program for the last couple of years. I was yeah. there with my buddy, Andy Bigsby. Um, and then I got... Th this opportunity, they reached out to me from Columbia Room. Nice. Just to touch on that, um, the chef Johnny Sparrow is a buddy of mine, and he just like asked me out to coffee, and it, the rest was history. It was yeah. I, you know, I needed to take a leap and do something after being there for so long. Um, everything was great, but it was just like this was a, a new adventure. Yeah. And I took it, put in my notice. Started at Columbia Room, and I was bartending. So I, like, again, kind of stepped away from the responsibility, yeah. or so I thought. <laughs> Turns out, everybody at Re Columbia Room is very responsible for everything. Oh, and that's man. why they are such an amazing team. Yeah. So that was an amazing six months. Um, while I was there, I got the opportunity at uh, Columbia Room. Yeah. Or, I'm sorry, at Wild at Turkey. So... That just like kind of caught me off guard, even though in the back of the mind, in my mind, having worked with them so much. So you were, you said it was only six months then at Columbia. Yeah, Room? only only six months there, and it, it was amazing. That team, 
I mean, there's a reason they get these nominations. Yeah. It starts at the top with their owners and the way that they work and the way that they take care of their people yeah. and the culture that they created for that company. It's phenomenal. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's it. It that's just the key. makes, that is the key. Yeah. And that's one of my huge beliefs. We won't get super into that sure. right now. But. Well, that's what you're talking about going to Nickel City later. Yeah. That is exactly the culture. Top down, man. Like yeah. make everybody responsible for a everybody piece of this thing. Care. Yeah, make them get buy-in. You know? So So they they approach you. Who is it that reached out? From, from Wild, Wild Turkey? Turkey? Yeah. So Marie Christofferson. She okay. works with Campari. Yeah. She's our manager of yeah. all the, everything. I don't know. Still kind of <laughs> figuring it out. She's my boss. Yeah. Um she called me one day, kind of out of the blue. And I was like, Wow. This is like a huge honor. Like I obviously need to think about this. They're asking me to relocate and stuff. L.A. or Austin, you said? L.A. or Austin was the original uh, choice. Yeah. We were always leaning towards L.A. Because your wife's from there. Because she's from there. And I was like, all right, I need to think about this. This is crazy. And then in the back of my mind, it's like, holy shit. I've basically been on like a four-year interview with them. Oh, yeah. And it started with behind the barrel mm -hmm. and just getting to know them. And then applying to be a mentor and getting accepted so I came back to Behind the Barrel the following year and yeah. was the guy with a couple others that were like, we did this before. We have the experience. Let right. us know if you have questions. We'll help you out, blah, blah, blah. And that, again, is like a little more of an audition. They want to see sure. how you handle that. Yeah. Um, then was going to Camp Runamuck for yeah. the second year. So I'd, I'd done that, you know, again, mm -hmm. just trying to put myself out there, apply, apply, apply to all these different things. Was going, and I was the counselor for okay. the uh, wild turkey cabin oh that's faithful so that was like fate right there yeah yeah and it was like cool now i get another chance to like represent the brand yeah and i did and i and i legitimately love it and it's because of the russells it's feeling like you're a part of that family when you meet them instantly Cult you culture, know man culture familial culture so that then and Louise said, hey, you should come down to Tails. I was already going with Jack Rose. Mm -hmm. But they were like, you should work this spirited dinner for Wild Turkey. And at the end, like, talk about Behind the Barrel and why it's awesome. And I was like, cool. So, again, like, worked, helped out. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, said some words. And then they're like, we're doing Behind the Barrel different next year. And we want to bring you back as a mentor again. I was like, for a third time? Like, is that even okay? <laughs> like, I feel bad. Can other people apply? <laughs> Am I blocking people out of this? Yeah. Thing? yeah. So they're like, no, it's going to be different this year. We're doing way more sessions. There's going to be 12 mentors covering the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a lot of people are getting this opportunity now. We're evolving it almost into, like, a part-time ambassador thing. Oh, wow. During the year. Yeah. So nothing, like, extended. It was just, like, promote behind the barrel go to behind the barrel host like a wild turkey activation mm -hmm. in your market and then like here's some money to go out and take people out and do wild turkey things so again kind of another little like audition i'm guessing yeah and i just loved it you know and i was out there spreading the turkey love yeah and then fast forward back to like you know six months in columbia room and they call me and they're like we're looking for a full-time person. Man. And I had I I got to think about it for a couple months, which was because well, you were you were married then, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah. So we had just got married. Yeah. And we got married in LA because my wife is from there. Yeah. And her family outnumbers my And they're they're all still out there, right? And they're all out there. Oh, good. Okay. So it was like we flew out, we had just been in LA, and then all this comes up, and it's just like again, more shit's just meant to be. Yeah. And there really isn't any other brand that I would drop everything for yeah i think about it all the time i mean i worked in a bar with thousands of whiskeys i love all sorts of whiskeys yeah. single malts irish whiskeys sure bourbon rye it's even a few okay canadian whiskeys out there. <laughs> um but I, there's just none that pops in my head that i'm like i can like live and breathe this i can be a part yeah of this. yeah none of them feel that way except that's, for wild turkey man it's beautiful it's I actually have a wild turkey tattoo that I've had no before any of this, really? more or less. Well, after behind the barrel, yeah, because that's like where the love really started. Sure, but before I ever like worked for them, it's 
fateful, man. Use that term yeah. again. And you, and how Plus, was your once wife? you have this many tattoos, you can just like just snap, add one. Add one. Snap one on. <laughs> Waldo is on your left arm, I think, somewhere mm, in there. Somewhere. <laughs> but your wife was like, "Yes," because it gets her back to family. Right? Oh, that was the big. That was the selling point, like for her. So she was totally, totally good. So she was on board even more than I was in the beginning. No way. Because I was like, we really need to think about this because I'm going to be traveling right. a shit ton. So she's like, no, it's cool. It's fine. We're, going, <laughs> we're moving to LA. And I'm like, but wait. Don't, are you trying I'm to like send me off? What are you, what are you like, I don't want to talk you out of it because I want to do it too, but I want you to like think about it. So we did. And ultimately I took it, man. It, was, it worked out. Yeah. And two months in, I've been on the road a lot. How's it going? With it's really, going fine. I mean, like, she's good to have some time. Yeah. yeah. Now she's getting a cat. <laughs> so this is like, she's like, L.A. and a cat. Done. This was the best thing it could have possibly. Yeah. Been. And it's good. And she's had a lot of time off from work right now. She's a bartender. Yeah. She actually worked for That's almost where you... two years at Jack Rose. Yeah. We met right before that. It was funny. It was when Trevor was still running the bar. Mm. She was working at uh, this really cool izakaya mm. called Daikaya. Awesome ramen place, small bar, lots of Japanese whiskey. Yeah. And I went over there to visit a buddy that she worked with, just met her while she was working. And then it was like two weeks later, she was working at Jack Rose. Oh, that's fate too. And we had already kind of like Facebook friended each other. Sure. And stuff. A little bit of flirting, all that. A little bit of that. And then we started like working together a little bit side by side because yeah. there was a time at Jack Rose too where I was still like, I was working on all three floors, like yeah. in one given week, like schedule. I'd be like, like Tuesday night in Dram and Grain, making yeah. cocktails for like 25 people. And then another night, like climbing a whiskey wall. That's cool though. And then on the weekends, it's like, like different fl- cranking you know? vodka sodas. Yeah. So there was like a night or two a week that I would actually work with her. And then the roof bar is huge. So we'd be like two opposite ends of the bar, like not even really interacting with each other. Yeah. But ultimately, as we started dating, we decided it wouldn't be good to work together. Yeah. And she she didn't like have to give up a lot she actually had like another opportunity and i was the one that worked there forever she was yeah. like well, let's go do yeah this she's like i'm gonna go do this other thing that i have an opportunity to do and it was perfect and yeah. then she ended up loving that even more yeah so she did that it was a place called compass rose cool neighborhood bar it's got some local accolades just for being like this awesome dark like loud cocktail place yeah People dance and get a little weird there. Sometimes they have karaoke. <laughs> they have hip hop nights. Like, nice. It's a cool neighborhood spot. And she loved that there. And then she also opened the Line Hotel, mm. one of the restaurants in there called A Rake's Progress. So that was very more like food focused, mm. something that she hadn't done in a while. So that was kind of cool too. She got to open that up. It was a lot like opening any hotel or any big bar or any bar for that matter. Yeah. Did, you know, you know, going back to. Because you guys just ran into each other. That's mm-hmm. kind of the secret to love. And not that this can turn to a romance podcast. Mm-hmm. It could, depending on how long we stay here. But were you ever like, was that a thing for you? Were you thinking about getting married? Was it even something you had an opinion about? Yeah, it was. Um, I was kind of raised that way as well. My, my parents are still together. They're big lovers. Yeah, They're very affectionate. Yeah. And... Um, so that's a good example for you. It was know? a good example. And I had all already kind of been like a relationship guy. Yeah. Like never lasted single that long. Maybe would like be with some, but I had like a few relationships that were like a year, two years. And yeah. then I actually had the one that was like four years and then that one didn't work out. And I met my wife after that one. So it was kind of like you go through a lot, mm-hmm. whether you are just, I think it's, pretty beneficial to actually have a lot of serious relationships yeah. because you really learn like what you need out of a partner. Yes. And after having had a handful of relationships that were all well over a year. And different, I imagine. And different. Yeah. You learn and realize, okay, I like this. I don't like that or whatever. Just to keep it simple. But um, yeah. And then when I met her, I just like kind of knew. So we were, we were two together a year before i proposed yeah and then we were or no a little more than a year like a year and a half i want to say and because we're about three years now so and we're engaged for a year yeah and you it's a 
November ish. Yeah. Is I don't know how I know that. I, I know weird things. I don't. Remember, I just remember dates for some reason. Yeah. But your birthday's coming up. You know. That's, yeah. Are you a Leo then? I am. First day of Leo. Oh man. Yeah. Uh huh. We got. We got. And like, she's like, a Leo also. She. Oh. Geez. She's into all of that astrology oh, and stuff. So she's like. Me too. Very. Oh. So much more to talk about, Benny. After we we wrap. So I got a couple questions left for you. This has been, I hope, a very adequate chronicling of your beautiful life so far. Here's the question I ask everybody, and I think it's kind of, I have no idea how you'll answer this one, but let's say this is the exact whiskey you're drinking, this barrel pick of the Russell's bourbon, beautiful. You are anywhere in the world, and you can just post up and have a conversation with anyone, living or deceased. Who would you love to just sit down with, talk about the world, talk about love, and everything in between? Oh, I'm so bad at these questions. Me too. But, it, you know, it's one of those things that's like, what's the color you're thinking of right now? Blue. Okay. So it changes right. with the season. You know? I got one. I would probably have to go with my, my grandfather, yeah. Harold. Harold? Harold okay. Hurwitz. My dad's dad. Yeah. I don't think he was a big drinker, but he passed away when I was like four. Mm. So recently I've been interested in like my family history a little more. I haven't quite dove in and done much research but my mom likes to tell me a lot of stuff about her side of the family yeah so i think it would be cool to like sit down with my grandfather that i never really knew i think that's a brilliant answer my grandfather was a drunk but a beautifully kind man and he was always drinking scotch when i saw him so i'd continue that shit for sure no one I, I has asked me that, but that's but you you know connecting to the mm-hmm. family and stuff i think it's really it's a really important thing so this is the first time you're in austin yeah. this is the first time you're in austin Anyway, but first time for the role. I'm sure you'll be back multiple times. What do you want to, what's left for you to do? You did some staff trainings and hung out in a happy hour. At yeah, academia. I think I got a few more things like that later today. Yeah. Definitely going to be some Nickel City visits. Yeah, you got it, man. It's, you'll, you'll get it. The culture's in the air. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, I'm just along for the ride. Usually the first market visit, they set me up pretty well with the local team and Carly's amazing, so, so good. she's taking care of me. Yeah. I just follow them around and take a lot of notes. <laughs> like, what's this place called again? What's that guy's name? Yeah. Cool. Like, legit. No, it's great. That's the big thing about this job. I take a lot of notes. Mm. Like, to do this well, I mean, you're out just, like, socializing and drinking. Mm-hmm. But you're, the idea is be yourself. You love what you're selling. So that's kind of the easy part. Right. Uh, you know, it's like building these relationships authentically. Yeah. You know, it's like. I'm here to spread the wild turkey love with these bartenders and bar managers and take them out and have fun with them yeah. and show them the versatility of the products, whether it's like just in cocktails or just the line itself, right. you know? And I kind of just lost my train of thought there. Well, it's a beautiful but, way, but you got to re- remember some names and all mm-hmm. this drinking is for a purpose to create a community. And yeah, spread. all this drinking making me lose my mind but uh, i don't even know how i've managed to sit here and ask questions for a fucking hour this is great i don't even know how long it's been <laughs> oh i love it because i get the meter right right behind me i'm so glad you're in town i know you'll be back and i hope that you're back mm-hmm. i hope to visit you in la i think that it's brilliant that you have this great relationship this great marriage and this is lovely lovely stuff and wild turkey is the original punk rock no better accoutrement for skate skating especially <laughs> dude so thank you so much cheers for that. taking the time out and uh you know i know you'll be back in austin soon let yeah. me know when you are cool this is brilliant thank you so much thanks mike chat soon cheers well there we have it what do you guys think mr benny hurwitz the latest addition to the wild turkey team is a brand ambassador again he'll be in town february 6th at seven grain austin taking us through a lovely tour those wild turkey sips. Not exactly sure what's in store for the evening, but I'm sure it will be delicious. And also one of the most memorable events. Now, this is what people tell me I was regrettably unable to attend. But for San Antonio Cocktail Conference this past week, this vintage wild turkey tour that Benny led people through. I hear it was just incredible. And you have just this amazing legacy and the flavors and the tradition behind wild turkey. And it's great to have someone like Benny who's worked at the Columbia Room, the Jack Rose Dining Saloon. All these great places in D.C. filled with whiskey knowledge, filled with humility, coming to the table and saying, man, 
Let's have a dram and let's talk wild turkey, a true family affair. Benny, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with me. And thanks, everybody, for listening to Show to V with Mike G. Even if you thought Jack Whitehall, I didn't know if I thought he was too funny, but then I watched Bad Education and watched him travel around the world with his father. Or if you're thinking, I need to get on seeing Glass, don't care about the low reviews, still got hope for the movie, please keep dancing.